Welcome to Happy Talks with Dr. Alice and Donovan. Dr. Alice Fong is a holistic, naturopathic doctor and founder of Amour de Soi Wellness. And Donovan Jensen is a software engineer and founder of HowToHappy.com. Together, they're out to cause more happiness in the world. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Hey. <laughs> so today on Happy Talks, we are going to be talking about self-esteem and what that means to us and what we can do about it. So Donovan, what are your thoughts about what we can do to improve our self-esteem or just your thoughts about self-esteem in general? Yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about self-esteem is kind of just uh, the range, I guess, across like ways that people identify it, right? So some people look at self-esteem as like, wow, this person is super confident and can go in and get anything done. Or this person has self-esteem because they, they like super highly value themselves. So I think for me, the first step here is kind of figuring out a definition or at least the way that I'm going to be talking about it. So to me, self-esteem is basically the way that you feel about yourself as well as how that comes to be presented, right? Like it doesn't necessarily matter a ton how people like how much esteem other people think you have, but it can be important for certain things like uh, making an impression or like business meetings or whatever types of things where it's important that people don't think that you have super low self-esteem because you may just be communicating less value than you actually have or even feel. So when it comes to self-esteem and kind of the ways to work on it, there are a lot of different strategies, but I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is you have to start with a baseline of thinking that you are a worthy and valuable individual. And that's not always the easiest thing for people to start with, right? Like that's the first step. And that is something that has a lot of problems for a lot of people based on their history. From there, however, like, and we can go into that a little bit more too, but from there, Uh, Once you have that baseline of value, then you can kind of do things like uh, review like accomplishments, right? Like see things you've done or remember kind acts you've done or just these various things that prove out that sort of value to yourself. You can do a lot of exercises like that to build even further. But again, sometimes getting that first piece of believing that you have inherent value, sometimes that takes some work. So those are some random scattered initial thoughts. What what are you thinking? (laughs) Well, yeah, that actually got me thinking about how I've developed my confidence and self-esteem over the years and that I think when we're kids or little kids, we don't really think about it too much. We're just like happy little kids, you know, going about our day, not caring what we wear or what we what our hair looks like none of that it doesn't just occur to us and then I think over time you know when kids start to tease you or bully you that kind of has an impact on your self-esteem and then you start to feel self-conscious and then you feel like you're you're not good enough and that kind of accumulates over our childhood and our adulthood and it I think it does take some work and effort to be conscious of you know, kids are kids and to not let it mean that I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy because of some things a mean kid said a few times. I think that kind of ripples on to in terms of if you don't figure out some of the tools that you need to manage some of those external opinions coming in early, then it, like you're saying, compounds and it follows you as you go out throughout life and you take these little comments and internalize them and allow those to dictate a huge amount of your Mm self-esteem. Whereas the more ideal version is basically you dictate your esteem and then you deal with those comments as they come in and you internalize them at a rate that you want to, as opposed to just saying, here's the stuff coming in. I just must accept it. You know, and it, I think it goes back to something we've talked about a little bit before, but the relationship of the people and the kinds of interactions you have kind of matter a lot too, because if, uh, you know, your mom or something says, you know, you, you shouldn't study this thing, you'll never be able to be a physicist or whatever, then that might have more weight than some random person saying that. And it's all about how much you internalize these kinds of different comments. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think there could be moments in our child, especially our parents have a big influence on us, obviously. And there could have been moments where, you know, maybe mom or dad was really tired and exhausted and wasn't really paying attention to you. Not that they were a bad parent, but they, they were exhausted from whatever they were dealing with in life. And then, you know, you show them like a really great painting that you're excited to show them and they're like, whatever. And then maybe in your little kid brain, you're thinking, oh, I'm not good enough. This is never going to be good. My parents don't like me, whatever. And that just kind of impacts, you know, my opinion about it. I think to some degree, every person has some level of that not good enough has occurred to them at some point in their life time where, you know, in high school, I was, I got really good grades, um, mostly, mostly A's, a few B's in here and there. And I, I remember one year, because there were, I'm trying to think of how many people were in my class, because it was a big high school, I think, I think at least a few hundred people in my class mm-hmm. year. And I think I was like, one year, not every year, but one year, I remember I ranked like eighth out of that. And I was like, wow, that's pretty, pretty awesome. And then I went to med school and I was like really, really struggling because I'm in school with all these super, super smart people. And I always felt inferior and insufficient to perform because I felt like I studied way, way longer and harder sometimes. And still other people who studied a few hours did better on tests than I did. So I always felt like, I'm not smart. I'm not good enough. All of all of that kind of got warped in my brain just because of like the environment that I was in. And it's not that I'm not smart, but when you're around a bunch of super smart people, <laughs> then it changes your perception of yourself. Yeah, when you're used to uh, being at a certain percentile in a group, and then you move to a group made of people out of that percentile, then, it, then the whole the whole structure shifts. And that actually made me think of something um, that I think is interesting where I think it's very common to tie, uh, like you were saying, some sort of ability to achieve or like outcomes to personal value. Whereas let's say that hypothetically, genuinely, you were not able to make it through med school. Like for whatever reason, you didn't, you weren't, you didn't have the skills, whatever else, no matter how much you studied, it just wasn't going to work. Even then, like in an ideal situation, we'd be able to remove kind of this outcome from our actual esteem, right? Our actual value. And I think that's a very, very common thing that people do is tie those two things together. So that if, if I can't achieve X, then I'm not, like you're saying, like enough, like a, a good person or whatever, these other kind of value judgments. Mm-hmm. And I think if, if we can get away from that a little bit, and again, it goes back to what I was saying about like having an inherent baseline of, of believing that you're a valuable individual, mm-hmm. um, then that helps like separate those things out. But I think that is probably the most common thing is people do not achieve in one realm and then tie that to how they feel about themselves, and then that just spirals downward. Right. Or, and, they're, and they're constantly comparing themselves to other people who maybe are performing or achieving more than they are, and then they're feeling inferior. But if you look at it, even you know, the, t- the billionaires in the world, they're, they're like, oh, well, I'm not Jeff Bezos, so <laughs> I could kill still this to keep still going. I don't know. I don't know what a billionaire would think, but just there's always like someone that's up in you. And so you want to just continue to go. But then if you're always thinking, oh, what I'm doing right now is never good enough, then that's dictating all your actions versus being like, I want this for, for me and my well-being. <laughs> Yeah, and I also think it's important too to to pay attention to the to the realms that we're caring about, right? Because if you just switch realms, like put anyone in a situation, right. and then switch realms on them enough times, and absolutely, there's going to be something that that you're not good at. There's going to be things that yeah. even if you really want to, you will not necessarily be able to achieve. Now, that's not the same as saying like you shouldn't try and just give up on everything. Yeah. But there, there will be things, there will be walls that we hit, there will be boundaries. So if we set our esteem and value ourselves as people based on our ability to achieve only, mm-hmm. 
-hmm. then that means we're guaranteed at some point to run into some sort of barrier. Mm -hmm. And then that puts our esteem kind of at risk. Right. No, I, I agree. Definitely. Yeah. The other, other thought that just came to my mind was thinking about how this one part in um, a book I read, the book is called Mastery of Love. And the idea is about first and foremost, having love and compassion for yourself. And there was one thing that the author had said is that our ability to tolerate abuse is dependent on our ability to tolerate abuse from ourselves mm -hmm. in a way. So meaning if like, if you were in an abusive relationship, if that person were to like pass the threshold of how bad you, like we have so many negative thoughts about ourselves all the time. And if that were to surpass it, then that would most likely push you to like break it off. But if it's just under that, then you, you maybe would stick around in that unhealthy relationship. But it's like our degree of what like, abuse we give ourselves really makes a difference on you know how much we receive from others so basically the idea is we have our own ideas of ourselves or like this this kind of model that we build of ourselves mm -hmm. um, of like our value and how we should be treated and that's how we treat ourselves and mm -hmm. then the idea is we use that model as a baseline for how we expect other people to treat us so if we have a model that says oh, like, I'm not a good person, I should be treated poorly, and you treat yourself poorly, then that also maps onto how the kinds of actions that you're willing to accept from others. And then if it gets past that model or is outside of that model, like, okay, I'm a kind of not good person, but you're treating me like a really terrible person, mm -hmm. that's when some other action happens. There's some sort of, like, pushback. Right, definitely. To illustrate point a little further is when I was dating in my 20s, I had this whole series of short-term relationships that would last one to three months. And I wanted a long-term serious relationship and I couldn't figure out why they kept ending. <laughs> why did they keep dumping me when they seemed really interested in the beginning? And I, I did a lot of personal development work, a lot of therapy, a lot of various things, books, meditation retreats to really do the the personal growth and development to discover that, yeah, I, I was always kind of putting it on the guys that I'm like, oh, well, I somehow date these emotionally unavailable men and they don't know how to commit and all these things. And I don't know why I keep going for that. And I realized it just really came more from me and that on some subconscious level that I, I have this story that I'm I'm not good enough. I let them, you know, like it was a doormat, <laughs> basically just, you know, I, I wanted their like love and affection. And, uh, you know, if they, not that they would like physically or verbally abuse me, but they would just like kind of take me for granted, I felt like. So, yeah, and I put up with it. I just put up with it, whatever. And now I feel like with the work that I've done that I have like a very small little <laughs> for that kind of shit <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah i would be curious to know because you kind of talked a little bit about you were looking at a bunch of self-development and tools and stuff i'd be curious if there was any specific point or exercise or message that stuck with you to help push away from that kind of lower self-image model towards a higher one and you can turn the question back around on me when when you're done but i've been trying to think of some exercises and stuff but <laughs> yeah. i haven't yet I think the thing that kind of turned it around for me, especially, I mean, it, it was a lot of things I had done, EMDR, which was eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And that was like a type of theory that made a big difference for me to get into a long-term relationship that I was in for almost four years. But I realized through landmark courses that there was even more, more layers underneath of all of that. And it kind of like stemmed from, you know, my relationship with my father and how I felt like not, not being a good enough daughter for him and being a disappointment of a daughter. And that was like a whole story and lie that I, I told myself and that he didn't care. So I felt like, you know, my father didn't seem to take an interest in my life. These men don't seem to take an interest in my life. They're just like emotionally unavailable. I don't know how to develop that. And um, I guess the thing that got me out of that was realizing that just 
all of that was not true. It was a story, a story an eight-year-old girl made up in her head about this time that when I was a kid that I didn't take this Chinese water painting class. I don't know if I've told this story. Have I? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> if not, I'll just say it again, where I thought, you know, because I didn't take this class that he wanted me to take, that made me a disappointment of daughter. And so I kind of withdrew from him and felt like I wasn't good enough and all of that. And that was why we don't have like a strong, close relationship. And what it took was like me being responsible for creating a connected relationship with him versus just being at the effect of of you know however he is that like if if that's something I want I have to create it for myself so yeah <laughs> yeah so I picked up two big themes which I think but that maps on really well to my experience one is kind of getting a sense of agency or control around a lot of the events and relationships in my life like that helped me a lot as well like you were just saying having seen some of the relationships and kind of blamed them externally or just right. thought like well that's how this person is so that's how they're going to act to me I, I can't do anything to change it which is not it's just a false belief of how things work right. the other thing that helped me a lot and it sounded like you had some of the same mm-hmm. pieces is being able to break down some of these thoughts and find their roots a little bit better, right? So some of the instances where I felt low self-esteem, something would happen and then I would short circuit into the end of some other story, right? Something not completely related, but close enough where like, okay, someone is saying that, you know, I'm not good at some sort of thing, right? Like a sport or something. There were stories that I've had in the past from myself, that it was saying like, oh, I'm not good enough about the, like in this realm. So mm-hmm. being able to see kind of the connections and some of the stories that I was short serving to, right? Like that really helped me get away from these kind of like very small things setting off and impacting my esteem negatively. And it's basically the same thing that you said, but a little bit different. But those are two of the big things that I picked up on that also have been monumentally useful for me. Great, yeah. Do you have any examples from your own life or any exercises that that you had implemented to kind of catch yourself or, you know, realize that you were having some self-esteem low points? Yeah, so I don't know if it's quite an exercise. I'll start talking about it and we'll see what it ends up as. <laughs> but uh, a big moment for me when, it was when I started, and this sounds so silly, but when I, when I started realizing that other people are all living out you know, their own lives in their own head, right? There's their, they are a person that is, has their own story and all their own things going on. And once I started being able to see like, okay, but this person did this to me, mm-hmm. but what is their story? Where, what are they operating out of? What is mm-hmm. the point of these actions? Right. Once I started thinking that way a little bit more, I started opening up the possibility a lot more often of instead of short circuiting to, oh, they don't like me. Oh, they think I suck. Oh, they think I'm a bad person Mm -hmm. to all kinds of other things of like, oh, well, they didn't want to go to that event because they don't like watching sports or Mm -hmm. they didn't want to do this thing because, you know, they were busy. They already had plans. It's not a reflection on me. So for me, and again, I don't know, it's quite an exercise, but starting to think that way. Mm -hmm. even though it's so simple, right? I should have known by the time I was a grown person that other people (laughs) have their own thoughts and ideas and things that they need to do. It doesn't necessarily involve you. (laughs) But it took me a while. It took me a while to realize Mm -hmm. how true that was and to stop tying events from other people and to to my own self-worth, especially since the majority of the time, the two were not related at all. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, like I was saying before, I kind of also was able to develop a little bit better sense of once I get those external uh, comments or whatever that Mm -hmm. could potentially make me feel sensitive, just realizing that I have more control over whether I go, oh, no, that person doesn't want to hang out with me. That makes me a bad person. Or if I just say, like, they don't want to hang out with me, even if they think I'm a bad person. So what? that doesn't impact my worth or value. So that's one of the main things um, that helped me a lot is to stop just going back to our other video, making assumptions, like just stop making assumptions about what people thought of me. And Mm -hmm. then the other piece was 
uh, building up some resilience towards, even if other people don't think I'm a good person. Yeah. Then what? What happened? Like, as long as the people that I actually care about mm-hmm. have the same sort of positive relationship towards me, right. that's what matters. It doesn't matter if some random person doesn't doesn't like something I'm doing or it doesn't matter even if the people that I care about think that I'm not good at a specific thing they still like me right and when I flip the flip the script around um Mm -hmm. and think about the people close to me in my life and I think about okay if my sister Mm -hmm. wasn't good at writing a book would I think that she has no value no so why would I let that judgment sit for myself like that's a that's a weird double standard yeah. to judge myself differently than other people yeah no that's a that's a really good point that you made about you know one going back to the assumptions part in that you know people are gonna think what they're gonna think and how you let that impact you makes the difference it's like they don't have the full context of whatever is going on and maybe they're thinking you did a bad thing because maybe they don't fully understand the issue and maybe they're not open to understanding or maybe they are and whatever they are, it's like, however they are. And it doesn't have to necessarily impact your value because if you're confident with what you are capable of and your value, then it shouldn't matter what other people think. Yeah. I also think that at least in my experience, it's like 80, 20 or more in terms of 80% of the time, those, interpretations or assumptions are just so completely off base, right? In terms of me assuming that someone else Mm -hmm. thinks that I'm a bad person or whatever else, right? Like the vast, vast majority of times Mm -hmm. I've ever done that, I've been wrong. So eventually (laughs) I realized that that wasn't serving me especially well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I do think that's something that is somewhat common for people to see actions from others and then assume that there's some sort of value judgment and then internalize that judgment. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It made me think of um, a a moment when I was, when I was back in my, my dating phase of also thinking about how, you know, before, like when men would like dump me or ghost me, that would piss me off like (laughs) tomorrow when I, when I got ghosted and it's just like me and my head spiraling about like, what happened? What did I do? I don't know. Is it, am I not pretty enough? Did I say something weird? Or like all of these thoughts. And then I would just be like spiraling about that. And then it just occurred to me one day where it's like, do I really want to be with someone who ghosts me? And the answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. So why am I obsessively thinking about why he didn't call me back or why he doesn't want to go out again? And when I just lift that little thought process and it's just like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> None of that really matters. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is something I'm very familiar with and don't miss at all, which is the <laughs> yeah. slow spiral into insanity from being ghosted and just being like, what, what, what's hap- what did I do? What? It makes such a big difference to just be able to catch those mm-hmm. trains of thought as they, as they occur and figure and see what the roots are because Mm-hmm. A situation like that is so easy. It's so easy when you don't have enough information. And I think a lot of people have this built as, as the default to right. spiral down into some sort of, well, it's my fault and I'm not good enough and I can't figure it out type right. of thing. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that is, gets kind of close to an exercise, which is trying to catch those moments. If you happen to notice that you are having really negative self-talk, walk yeah. back through kind of what happened and see like the train of that thought Um, because I think being able to identify those things makes it easier to see when when the forks actually happen Mm -hmm. and guide yourself towards a direction that doesn't end in low self-esteem and really negative self-talk. Yeah if only there was some device that you know when that little negative voice in your head is talking at you being like oh they don't like you you're not good looking enough or you're not smart enough. <laughs> Just like an alarm would go off to be like, Oh, there it is. You gotta <laughs> stop it. Let's backtrack. Is this real? <laughs> or is this just true? That That's yeah. a billion trillion dollar idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If only, <laughs> but, but I, I get that. It's just like, it's going to happen to everyone. And it's, I think the thing that's important to know is that it's, 
I don't think that little negative self-talk is ever going to go away, but you can train yourself to be like, okay, well, that's just, you know, that little voice saying you're not good enough. And that doesn't mean anything because real in the reality of the situation is like, it's whatever it is. And I do think that's one of the benefits of meditation or practices Mm -hmm. like that, that help you kind of train seeing your thoughts a little bit more clearly Mm -hmm. and more often is you just happen to catch those things more and that catching part is Mm -hmm. so important for being able to take Mm -hmm. action to kind of guide things in the right direction that catching part is the difference between feeling down or having low self-esteem for five minutes or having it for five months like it's such exactly because you're stuck on that like believing that little thought is the reality of the situation when it's not it's just a thought that you had and it's like I think it is like training a muscle to you have to exercise and catching it and like the more you do it the more you exercise that muscle then it's easier and you can get out of it a little quicker versus being like oh there's a negative thought that's just my brain sometimes (laughs) move on (laughs) and I mean I would say from my experience there was definitely in the past before I started trying to consciously mm-hmm. pay attention to some of this stuff, days where I would just sit mm-hmm. on some little comment that didn't really mean that much and just play it over and over mm-hmm. and over, especially like we were talking about in the dating realm, like some little interaction that I would just key off of for days and days at a time. And now I don't think that there's anything that can sit in my brain and bother me that much. Um, I'm much more quick to accept and process things. Just like, wow, that thing that I said was super awkward. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, like, so be it. So what? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. And sometimes it helps if it's like a similar situation that happens and then you get to be like, oh, this is what happened with my brain last time. Mm-hmm. I can change. Like an example I thought of just now is when I've invited people to like a group event and I sent like a group text or a group email or a Facebook invite and then nobody RSVPs. I feel like then I I make it mean like, oh, nobody likes me. Nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants to come to my thing. Nobody cares. All All of that in my brain. And I realize it's just like people are bombarded with all sorts of invites all the time and even I'm guilty like I get emails and texts and invites and I don't always respond (laughs) I'm guilty of it but even though I'm guilty of it when it happens to me I still am like oh they don't care nobody cares nobody's like yeah so I realized to help me cope with that or realizing that just people are busy and they just because they didn't answer doesn't mean they don't care about you I started to just when it's like an important event, I'm more likely to individually like text people or call them versus just like a group message. I feel like people in general don't respond typically to those, not usually. (laughs) So I've just trained myself to know that this is how it is. And sometimes you have to message people individually. And even then they might not respond, but they're more likely to at least. (laughs) Yeah, that reminded me of uh, in the past, I was trying to put some events together. Like every once in a while, first of all, I hate planning events. I hate it a yeah. lot. <laughs> but every once in a while, I would try to have, you know, some get togethers with friends and do some some sort of thing. And mm-hmm. people were responding, but every time everyone was responding, no. Mm-hmm. And so that quickly got me like by the second or third time I tried to do, and this is spaced out relatively far, but yeah. the second or third time I tried to kind of put an event together, mm-hmm. I was like, this nobody wants to spend time with me. Like I have my friend or two, but no one wants to come. Like this sucks. These are people that I care about. These are people that I want to see. Like it's, it really sucks that like it's not being reciprocated. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I tried to put one event together and then I talked to someone who hadn't come to any of the things. And this is again, going to make me seem extremely naive, but the person was basically like, you are not giving anyone enough time to plan for these things. <laughs> You're basically setting an event for the next day and people already have stuff planned. People have stuff to do. Right. People aren't coming because they don't want to come. They're coming because they already have things planned because there's right. a part of your process is extremely broken. <laughs> yeah. And it was a little bit of like, that moment was a little bit of an eye opening. Like, mm. wow, I spent all this time 
worried about like, oh no, nobody likes me. Or like, these people don't want to spend time with me. These are the people I care about. Right. When really like there was some other stupid thing that I was missing and not paying attention to. That was the real root cause. Um, right. That was, that was one of the moments in my self-esteem journey that I was like, wow, I wasted so much time just <laughs> building these stupid narratives when really I'm just not, I'm not good at planning events. <laughs> <laughs> not that people want to see me. It's that I'm not good at planning events. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point, and I think we should evaluate the the whole situation instead of jumping to the conclusion that they don't like us. Maybe consider there's other factors <laughs> involved that maybe why they're not responding, perhaps, or yeah. And I think it's sometimes things don't. Thing, not everything that could happen occurs to us. Sometimes I realize like something will happen and it just never occurred to me that, oh yeah, they have like a regular meeting at that time. So why should I invite them when I know they have something regularly scheduled at the time? So why should I be upset with them if they can't make it? Yeah, so. There is one more thing that I wanted to touch on, which is I think we've spent a good chunk of time talking about mm -hmm. uh, kind of the external to internal flow of like actions to self-esteem. I do think there are some cases, and I've been guilty of it as well, of feeling like low self-esteem, not guilty. I've experienced this as well, mm -hmm. uh, feeling low self-esteem even when other people are trying to kind of bolster you, right? Like, yeah. oh, wow, I'm never going to be able to finish this project when everyone around me is saying that I can or mm -hmm. that I should, but then still feeling like because I haven't finished it yet that I'm not a good person. Right. Um, and I think these internal thoughts, one of the ways to help beat those back a little bit is recognizing that just because the thought shows up doesn't mean we have to keep it and identify with it, right? Like you were saying, the negative self-talk will probably never go away, but one of the pieces of it is recognizing that thought and realizing that I don't have to say or stay with the idea that that thought brings, right? Just because my brain made it doesn't mean I need to keep it. Um, I think that's one thing that we haven't quite touched on yet because sometimes I've experienced negative self-talk completely independent of anything anyone else is doing. My brain is just making it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. So from what I was hearing and what you were saying is that we are going to have all these negative self-talk that come but it's just developing the skill to let it go and just like move past it move through it and be like oh there it is <laughs> and there it goes yeah versus yeah. being just like stuck on it yeah and especially for me at least mm -hmm. um the piece that unlocked it a lot was not identifying with it right so mm -hmm. the difference between saying like i'm not a good person right and then thinking oh i had that thought so I must believe that about myself and that must be true about me as opposed to I'm not a good person. And then going like, wow, my brain just made a thought that said, I'm not a good person. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to keep that one brain. Like I'm not, I'm not down with this thought. I'm going to let this one go. <laughs> it doesn't line up with what I, <laughs> I want myself for myself in my life. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. What about children, you know, who maybe have not developed the skills yet to, you know, when little kids are, are being mean to each other or saying, like, you look stupid or you're a poopy face or <laughs> whatever they, they say to each other. I don't know what kids are saying these days. But like, how to not let that affect them? I would not say that I'm the most experienced at this. So let's just put caveats, asterisks everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But I think it is about explaining some of these concepts that we've talked about already in a way that are that's digestible. And I think, I don't know, I, I would actually love to try this and get some more experience, but you know, things like trying to, I, I'm not sure what it looks like, but the conversation to try to convince, you know, like an eight year old that mm -hmm. a comment that someone else made doesn't necessarily need to have any impact on you, right? That the way that you choose to digest that comment mm -hmm. dictates how you're going to feel I don't know how that conversation would go. I don't know how hard it would be to try to start putting some of these ideas mm -hmm. into young minds. 
Right. Yeah. Maybe we should bring on an expert guest <laughs> for that kind of conversation, <laughs> which we are planning to do at some point to start yeah. bringing on guests to a show. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I have, I, yeah. I have the opportunity. I am home since we're all home oh, yeah. from the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. I do have young siblings. Oh, yeah. You could <laughs> practice on them. <laughs> yeah. Who have experienced some mm -hmm. amount of bullying recently that I know about. Yeah. So I could try it. But <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's that's what a big a big part of it is is, is just trying to get that distinction. And, and I don't know the specifics for this, but the distinction between being valuable just because you're a person and people are valuable, and then kind of the, another piece is how you digest external comments and events, and mm -hmm. knowing that your worth is actually separate from what anyone else can do. And then the last piece being. Mm -hmm again, worth is not necessarily tied to achievement, right? Like you don't have to be good at basketball to be a good right. person. You don't have to get an A on every single test to be a good person mm -hmm. or to be enough yeah. or all these other common phrases that it seems like people as they grow up can end up hanging on to and having negatively affect them. And I think probably mm -hmm. getting those concepts as a baseline for kids, mm -hmm. I would imagine would be easier. It's probably easier to convince them mm -hmm. that their worth is independent of some of these other things because they don't have nearly as much history built up and all these other stories and all these other frames that we do as adults, but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know completely either uh, because I don't have kids yet, but I am gonna see my niece and nephew tomorrow. So maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll try some things out on them. <laughs> but but um, what you just said though, about kind of collapsing self-worth and value with like what you have achieved and accomplished. I think <laughs> what stood out in my mind, I'm like, oh man, in, in Asian culture, <laughs> especially just like that is totally collapsed all the time. It's just mm -hmm. you're, and it's not, in, intentional but it just felt like you know your value if you don't get good grades then you're bad <laughs> like you're a bad child but in the same way I could see like the benefit of that in that me trying to achieve a lot you know going to med school doing all these things it's kind of pushed me to do a lot because maybe in some sense I was trying to prove myself to to do whatever I, I don't know what are your what are your thoughts about that <laughs> I don't have a super great way to prove this out um but I think like you were saying it could potentially be a source of motivation mm -hmm. but I believe very strongly that you could achieve the same sort of motivation or drive without using those techniques right you can share different ideas and values and get the same sorts of results. Clear like parallel to me is like a lot of people get worried that if they meditate a lot, they're gonna lose their edge. And they're not gonna have drive to do things because they're not gonna be getting pushed ahead by whatever, whatever like crazy stuff they have going on. But everything that I've seen has shown that you just get more clear and calm and, but you still achieve the same, right? You're still able to achieve and maybe even more. And so in the same way, I think that there is an equally useful way, and I don't, I don't have the specifics off the top of my head, but an equally useful way to build esteem while keeping drive and showing kind of the value of achievement, right? There, there are things to be said for getting stuff done and having achievements and doing things. Yeah. Uh, but I think tying your motivation to fear of losing your value as a person mm. is not the ideal way to do it. I think there are other ways that you can maintain that, but still get people to move forward. I think the other problem that you run into is that you got a lot of that stuff done, right? You were able to accomplish many of those things. Right. So on the flip side, for someone who is pushed into things that they either do not want to do at all, Mm -hmm. or don't have an aptitude for, they're going to end up with the same amount of achievement that they would have and no esteem, right? Because they're not, regardless of if uh, someone is pushing them or not, mm -hmm. if you don't have an aptitude or desire to do something, you're probably not going to do especially well. Right. So, right. and uh, I, you know, to give a more fair picture, I'm sure there are some instances where people accomplish a lot more than they would have because they had those two more tightly coupled. 
-hmm. I just think that there's there's got to be some other third third path, some other better way to get that done. Right. Yeah. I I mean I absolutely believe it's it's possible to still be driven, motivated, um, without collapsing like your value is tied to it. And ideally, I I would prefer to have pushed myself because I knew I was capable of it. I had the confidence and self-esteem that I knew I could do it versus being like a fear-based motivation because, oh, I, I'm not valuable and I'm not enough if I don't do this thing. And I feel like probably the results would be more better or, or feel more gratifying if it came from the, you know, I know I can do this confidence mentality versus the fear mentality. Yeah. I wish, I wish it was something that I, that I had a better alternative for off the top of my head too, Mm -hmm. because I, I I just have this very strong feeling that Mm -hmm. there almost definitely is something. I just can't think of what the other motivational trigger would be. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and the other thing that I think probably would make uh, some people nervous who are like more used to this tactic or approach Mm -hmm. is that what people produce may not be aligned with what their parents want if they're not using some sort of fear-based or like esteem-based thing, right? So to to make that make a little bit more sense, if achievement and esteem are not closely tied together Mm -hmm. and I say like, hey, as my kid, I want you to go be a doctor. And they're like, no, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. Like if I have those decoupled, then what I have to say is like, okay, well, I support you for whatever choice you make. Mm-hmm. Like, I think you should do this, but I support you to whatever choice you want to make. However, mm-hmm. that might lead to a path of like a very, very difficult career. But again, mm-hmm. in the grand scheme of things, for me, at least for me, happiness is like one of the highest values, right? Yeah. So it doesn't matter to me or wouldn't matter to me if, if I had a child that was not successful by any conventional means, like, right. but had the type of life that they wanted. Now, if they're working at, I don't know, some something for minimum wage that they hate, right. and, and they also did not want to go to school and also did not want to do, you know, like if their mm-hmm. life is bad and they have no measures of conventional success, that's mm-hmm. that would be unfortunate. That would not be ideal. I think it really boils down to like clear communication in that if you're clear with your child that whatever they do, even if it's not, if you know maybe it's not going to be the most successful career or it could be, you know, potentially, you know, if they want to be an artist, great. But, you know, it's tough for artists to make it in, what is it, like 1% or 2% like actually can successfully do it full time for their living. And so like the odds aren't in your favor, but if you were like, I will love you and support you and it doesn't change how I feel about you, whatever career that you choose, but I just want you to be aware of like the risks and I want you to to, like factor it in and, you know, but it doesn't mean like take that corporate job. Um, But like, if you really want to pursue your dreams, really like factor in, are you really going to push all in or are you just kind of doing it as a, a side hustle or as a hobby like are you willing to commit everything you got and it still might not be prosperous at all but if it gives you joy and happiness that's that's going to be the thing that drives you versus being like I don't really want to do anything so (laughs) I'm just going to say this is the thing I want to do yeah I guess that's that's the difference right the difference is between basically wanting someone else to be cognizant Mm -hmm. of the full implications right like as a parent you have a better idea of how things will turn out on certain pathways or the types of challenges that certain pathways tend to present Mm -hmm. the other side of things which i think is a a lot more common is kind of this like imposition of values in terms of well doctors are seen as successful i think they're successful that Mm -hmm. seems fancy to me you should do that without really getting into like the headspace of the other person and considering Mm -hmm. like is this something that they would enjoy at all? Do they care if they have that much money, right? Like maybe you want to be an artist and you're not that good and you barely make enough money to scrape by, but you don't 
mind living in a small apartment with a roommate, why would I be able to say like, well, you shouldn't do that if that's what somebody wants to do? I think that's the difference is like showing kind of the pathways or providing extra information or uh, just giving more context or kind of like really pushing these values Mm -hmm. or ideas or paths externally without considering Mm -hmm. what the other person wants. Yeah. They have to factor in that like even doctor seems prestigious and successful. Doctors have to pay a six figure student debt. (laughs) Like we are not rolling in it. So I'm just like, we have way more debt. So that's like, I don't, I don't know. I could have maybe been more successful as a plumber. (laughs) like without accumulating such ridiculous student loans. So, uh, you know, I, I personally, and I'm not trying to like put judgment on parents for whatever they do, but you know, I think when I do have kids and they're getting around the age of ready to go to college, I don't actually think that if they don't know what they want to do for college, that seems like a waste of money. If they're going to go in with an undeclared major, like they don't have a clear idea, I think it would be a better investment to go into like trade school. That would not cost as much and you would be making a good income once you're, once you're done with a year or two of training that it would take. And that would be like, you know, people, there's nothing, nothing wrong with being a plumber. That's a very practical tool that everyone needs in every city. So skills, yeah, so. But it doesn't have like the prestige as a doctor. But I'm like, I don't know. When you when you don't have a six figure student loan, you gotta factor that in. Yeah. <laughs> so going all the way back to our original topic mm-hmm. of esteem, I think that's I think that's what makes a big mm-hmm. difference is the way that that's kind of communicated, right? And, mm-hmm. and in terms of separating out esteem from achievement, right? Mm-hmm. There's yeah. achievement for the sake of you wanting to do something, right? Like if you want to go to trade school and become a plumber, Mm -hmm. that should be weighted as a good enough achievement. Like there's there's nothing wrong about that. But I think sometimes the like parents or like the relationships get caught in these traps where it's like, I don't know that this achievement is good enough, right? Mm -hmm. Like that comes, that's something that people feel from parents all the time Mm -hmm. where it, it's just such a, it's like an imposition of values. And to me, that's such a easy way to put someone on a path towards lower esteem is Mm -hmm. by saying like, here's my values. You need to follow them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's, it's basically, even though not explicit, it's basically saying like your love for me is dependent on achieving in this certain way. Mm -hmm. And I don't, that's, that's bad recipe. No, I think I, I get what you're saying that, the, the two shouldn't be dependent on each other. It's clear that they should be separate components. I guess what I was trying to get at for that specific piece is that mm-hmm. two people's idea of achievement can be very different. So the things that I want to achieve, mm-hmm. I might think these are really cool. And this provides me enough value that gives me worth. But if mm-hmm. someone else from the outside, like if you say, hey, this book that you've been writing is dumb. That's not what you should be working on. You should be working on this mm-hmm. new I don't know, computer project. I think that when that mismatch happens, that can cause lower esteem. Yeah. No, I can agree with that. That's all I've got. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next time. See ya. You can check out more content at howtohappy.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you can stay up to date on the videos. We've also got a Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook that you can check out. See you next time.